Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Nick Clark, the Department Head of Political Science, Director of Public Policy and Director of the Innovation Center at Susquehanna. Welcome to a conversation about criminal justice with Shelby Diggs-Smith and Orville J.R. Reynolds. And tonight, we will discuss the interdisciplinary fields that often intersect within criminal justice, including sociology, psychology, criminology, public administration, law, and political science. Additionally, I will highlight Susquehanna's new criminal justice major, uh, which is launching next fall. Uh, and if you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A. We'll do our best to answer them at the end of the session. Uh, so let me present our two panelists this evening. First, we have Shelby Diggs-Smith, who graduated from Susquehanna in 2012 with a degree in creative writing and was a member of Sigma Kappa Sorority. In 2019, she earned a master's of social work degree from Temple University College of Public Health and joined the Defender Association of Philadelphia, where she currently serves as a mitigation specialist in the homicide unit. <clears throat> Orville J.R. Reynolds graduated from Susquehanna in 2000 with a degree in political science, a minor in legal studies, and was a member of the football team. He's been an active alumnus serving on the alumni board and currently is a, a member of the Alumni of Color Advisory Council and the board of directors. He earned a Juris Doctorate of Law degree from Toro University Jacob D. Fuchsburg Law Center in 2007. He served as Assistant District Attorney in the Bronx District Attorney's Office for 12 years and is currently the Chief of the New York City Law Department's Major Case and Advanced Litigation Unit. Welcome to Shelby and JR. Thanks for joining us tonight and offering us uh, all of your expertise in these areas. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So I have a number of uh, questions that we developed ahead of time and that we shared with JR and Shelby. Uh, and I'm gonna start asking them first. There's no real limits on them and we're gonna hopefully have something of a free flowing discussion, but I will be monitoring the chat. And so again, oh, and the Q and A. So if anybody uh, in the audience has questions, please do post them. And we do have a few questions that were submitted ahead, ahead of time and we will um, move on to those as well. Uh, so let me kick off uh, by asking, you each what you think is the single greatest issue confronted within the criminal justice system today. Uh, and maybe we can start with JR on this and we'll sort of alternate back and forth as we go. Yeah. Um, well, it certainly isn't a perfect system. Um, there are a lot of challenges in many areas. But um, one thing I would outline just being a prosecutor uh, in New York, I'm acutely familiar. Um, we have we have uh, um, heavy criminal dockets here in here in New York. And probably it's similar across many of the major cities in America. Justice delayed is justice denied in some cases. Um, your witnesses don't get better over time, the story or the testimony doesn't get better over time. So with time, memories fade, people become less uh, cooperative, less willing to testify at a criminal trial. And um, the dockets here uh, for example, in, in New York City, uh, a, a person could uh, await trial anywhere from one uh, to as much as five to six years. I've seen someone wait around for a trial. That creates a lot of uh, collateral consequences uh, with respect to possible employment, um, housing, um, um, being able to take care of one's family uh, because their, their status is still in limbo. So that is certainly a challenge. We need to hire more judges. We need to um, uh, build more courthouses, perhaps, um, as well as other holistic approaches to reducing uh, the dockets. Should I just go ahead? Um, yeah, it's interesting. We, JR and I are two sides of the same coin. It's kind of interesting because I'm on the defense side and you're on the uh, prosecution side. Um, I would echo a lot of what you said though, um, especially during COVID. Um, a bunch of my attorneys in my office actually uh, prepared sworn affidavits because we were building a lawsuit against the Philadelphia Department of Prisons because of how unfair the conditions were during COVID, um, how unhealthy, how unsafe. Um, and that leads me to what I believe to be <laughs> one of the biggest issues, which is cash bail. Cash bail is unbelievably racist um, and prohibitive. It's, it's a prohibitive practice that almost nobody can partake in. 
Um, so if you're not familiar um, about, at least in Philadelphia, I can only speak to Philadelphia, um, about 70% of people in county jail, so not prison, um, about 70% of people in county jail are being held pre-trial. So they have not been convicted of a crime. They've been charged, but not convicted. They have not either entered their own guilty plea of their own volition, and there are safeguards against um, people being coerced into making uh, guilty pleas or um, not being able to for a variety of reasons, um, or they have been adjudicated guilty in a court of law by a judge or jury, right? So up until that point, they are innocent, and the only reason why they are in jail is because they cannot make bail. Um, so cash, <laughs> so bail is an issue, but cash itself um, is a really big issue because people are being forced to liquidate their assets, to put liens on their homes. Um, and in the very real presence of redlining and other sort of discriminatory housing practices that still plague us to this day, um, like 98% of my clients are black. So, um, cause I'm in Philadelphia. So these are just the, the statistics that I'm the most familiar with. Um, these are black families that have had barriers to home ownership and are now being forced to put up their homes or uh, property, cars, whatever, to be able to liquidate their assets and have cash to bail out their mom, their grandmother, um, their brother, whomever. Um, so on a grander scale, racism. <laughs> um, and then I just decided to focus on cash bail. I think that's a massive, massive problem. So I wanna follow up with you both. And I, I think JR, I'll maybe start with yours and then move on to your point, Shelby. But with the uh, um, with the caseloads being what they are, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of media coverage recently about the decisions of prosecutors in different cities not to pursue criminal charges uh, for certain types of offenses against people. It's something, especially with the trial of President Trump going on in New York that, that he and some of his allies have focused on. And it oftentimes, I think it's presented in all sorts of different types of media as being a sort of conscious decision to go soft on crime. But I mean, listening to you talk about it, I do wonder if it's not just a capacity question, right? There's only so many, so much time and so many resources. And so if we're not seeing prosecutors in different areas choosing strategically what to pursue based on what they have available to them. Was that directed at me? Yeah, yep. Okay. All right. First, I just want to say, I'm um, speaking as JR, not in any official capacity or on behalf of the city or anything. But um, what I would say to that is each each uh, district attorney uh, in New York City within the five boroughs are independently elected. And they have unfettered um, um, uh, what we call prosecutorial uh, discretion. Um, and that that platitude essentially means they could choose what to prosecute, when to prosecute, how to prosecute, what not to prosecute. And um, um, each office is going to make their own decisions as to um, um, what they, they choose not to prosecute. Some prosecutors um, um, will get labeled as progressives uh, if they do, and sometimes that's used in a pejorative, uh, if they do things like uh, decide not to prosecute turnstile jumps or not to prosecute uh, marijuana smoking when that uh, was still on the books or not to pr uh, prosecute criminal uh, trespass in, in housing authority buildings. Certain prosecutors will make the decision that that's not where uh, their resources ought to be. Other prosecutors in other types of jurisdiction may feel uh, that there's a need to continue to prosecute those crimes because um, as some folks argue, uh, uh, if you forget about the small stuff, it's going to lead to 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 bigger stuff. And so there is, uh, you know, two sides uh, to every coin, um, and uh, prosecutors get to make those determinations based on um, their vision of the world and how they see things. Okay, thank you, uh, Shelby. I wanted to ask you about that point too. And in some ways, I kind of wonder if if you, the two issues are related. But have you seen that on the defense side in terms of JR's original point about there, there really being too much of a backlog and not enough capacity in the legal system to manage the caseload. Do you do you experience that as well? Definitely. Um, I mean, Philadelphia has 
a really high rate of people being charged with homicide. Um, it's, it's very high. Um, we are incredibly uh, overworked is maybe not the word I wanna use, but we all have very large caseloads. Um, and the public defender in Philadelphia represents 70% of all people arrested. So that's just not, that's not just all people who cannot afford private counsel um, or all people who have been charged with homicide. It's, it's if you have been handcuffed and arrested, 70% of those people are our clients, which is hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and we work really hard and we do what we can, but the reality is our bandwidth is pretty, is pretty stretched. Um, so I would definitely agree that um, we have much more work to do than workers to do it, um, which could be a larger testament to just public service in general, <laughs> um, any sort of public health or public service profession um, where people are paid less than their counterparts um, in the private sector, or um, I don't need to go too far into that, but it, we, we, are, we are at capacity. Um, and at least in my office, we're funded by City Hall. We're not a city agency though. Um, so Pennsylvania is a commonwealth, not, <laughs> so Pennsylvania is technically a commonwealth. So um, the commonwealth, um, all of the people at the district attorney's office have .gov email addresses because they are considered like city employees and we aren't, we're a nonprofit organization, but we are funded through city council. Um, so we have to appeal to them every fiscal year and ask them to pay us. Um, almost all of our budget goes to salary. So um, I guess my point is, um, yeah, we are, the demand is high and there are trends. Um, as soon as the sun comes out, um, people kind of come out of hibernation and there is uh, kind of a natural friction in neighborhoods um, that kind of went dormant over the winter. So you'll see like an uptick in um, certain charges being lodged against people when spring starts. It's, 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 it really is kind of a, a, a character study in, I guess, societal patterns and how people work within a group and things like that. Thank you. Are butting heads at a certain point. JR, I wanted to, to step back a moment too and ask you if you have any thoughts on Shelby's point about uh, cash bail and how that's a huge issue and, and particularly the racist implications of it. Well, um, I, I agree that um, um, folks shouldn't uh, be uh, denied the opportunity to remain um, in the community simply because um, um, they don't have the money to post a bail. However, I do believe that um, uh, judges need to uh, be able to have um, uh, discretion as to who to release and who not to release. Judges ought to be able to take into consideration um, um, one's history and character in the community. Is this someone that's suffered 15, 16, 17 arrests over their career? Um, or is this someone that goes to work every day and tries to take care of their family? Um, uh, what is the nature of the offense that is alleged? Uh, is it just so heinous that perhaps um, 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 they ought to be uh, kept pre-trial? Um, does the judge view this individual based on their history and character and the nature of the, uh, of the offense alleged that this person is an ongoing threat to public safety? And if you check those boxes, um, I believe that uh, it's appropriate uh, in those circumstances that those folks, uh, irrespective of how much money you have um, or how much money you don't have, I'm in favor of a release or remand system, which is the way it is in family court uh, in New York. There's no amount of money. You could be Bill Gates' uh, daughter. 
the only amount of money can get you in or out. Uh, so uh, I'm in favor of that in the adult system where um, 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 the wealthiest among us, if they meet the criteria that I just outlined, uh, the judge can keep them in. If they don't, then uh, they can be released. And so I, I'm in favor of taking cash out of the system entirely, but I also uh, want judges to have the ability to protect the uh, uh, community at large by uh, uh, taking a look at each and every uh, single person that comes before the court. Great, so we'll move on to the next question now and just to kind of flip the page on it, I wanna ask you each something that you think is working well about the system or one way in which the system actually does right by people. Uh, and Shelby, I think we'll start this one with you. Yeah. Um, what comes to mind is that um, this has been for capital cases, um, but we kind of extend that to all homicide cases because there's a moratorium on the death penalty in Pennsylvania. But as we saw with Roe v. Wade, things can change <laughs> in a matter of seconds where things that are protected no longer are. So, um, and to be clear, you can't be sentenced to death anymore, but all the people that were on death row still are, right? It's not like it like went away. It's just it, like after that point, it couldn't be, um, you can't, you couldn't be sentenced to death. Um, so I say that because in capital cases, according to the American Bar Association, there need to be trial partners. So two attorneys, um, an, an investigator and a mitigation specialist. Um, and each client is entitled to those four people on their defense team. We've kind of extended that to all homicide. Um, and I am one of three people who do what I do in Philadelphia. Um, so there are SD, there are social workers in special defense, um, which is all the cases that have garnered a lot of media attention, uh, pressure from Larry, pressure from um, Kenny. Um, I'm, uh, I'm listing people who you probably don't know who I'm talking about. Pressure from Larry Krasner, um, our district attorney. Uh, pressure from um, our mayors, our city council, whomever. Um, all of those cases that are very high profile are in special defense, as are lots of other cases that um, are, I guess, salacious or newsworthy or something. We have social workers that are in SDU and then three mitigation specialists in homicide. So something that I appreciate that exists is that um, you can't have, if you're charged with homicide, you are entitled to mitigation specialist. And that's critically important because at least in Pennsylvania, um, we go off of this thing called the Pennsylvania basic sentencing matrix and it takes into account your offense gravity score and your prior record score. So sort of like JR was saying, your um, sheet, your history in the system, and I guess the gravity of what you've done that has you before the judge now. Um, and it kind of spits out a number of years and takes nothing else into account. So to preserve individual, in, like an individual's experience, um, and to actually uphold their constitutional rights to effective and fair legal counsel, um, we are there. And it's a really good thing we are because I could get into it later, but there are all sorts of examples of literal life or death situations where because I'm looking at their medical history, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I prevented them from being sentenced to a period of time that would automatically mean they were going to this facility and that facility wasn't equipped to take care of their medical needs. And I'm the only person who knows that because I'm the only person that knows they have this problem. Um, so in one way it's working. There are a lot of ways that it's not. In one way it's working. I appreciate that at least in Philadelphia, um, we've made it a priority to provide a well-rounded uh, defense team that has kind of varying skill sets. Um, Shelby, can you tell us real quick just what your primary objective is, is as a mitigation specialist? I don't know if many people will have heard of that, that role or that position before. Yeah, so um, 
obviously the word mitigation is just a word that's not specific to um, any sort of industry, but um, I'm mitigating down from the sentencing guidelines. Okay. So in the sentencing matrix, you have the offense gravity score, prior record score spits out a number of years. And um, I guess the assumption is that the Commonwealth will argue for the guidelines. They would argue for um, the sentence to be where the guidelines are. Um, there's a range. So like you would go into it assuming that they would argue for the top of the guidelines. Um, and so I would be mitigating down from that based on very critical information that I've gathered through biopsychosocial interviews, collateral interviews from family. I subpoena a lot of medical records. I go through thousands and thousands of pages of medical records. Um, and this is to provide very, very, very critical context. Um, I guess to speak to the thing I was alluding to a minute ago, I had a client who was in renal failure um, and nobody knew, and they sentenced him to 12 to 15 or something, or they were, they asked to sentence him to 12 to 15. And I asked for 10 to 12, I, via the attorney on the case, um, asked for 10 to 12, because that would mean he would be going to a different facility where they had dialysis and they didn't have dialysis at the 12 to 15. So they didn't realize that by sentencing, by sentencing him to 12 to 15, he would like die immediately <laughs> because he was in dialysis three times a week. Um, because I'm the one going through with a fine tooth comb, looking at all their records. Um, in a more abstract way, because that's pretty concrete, in a more abstract way, we're looking at mental health, abuse histories, really, really profound child uh, sexual abuse, physical, emotional, psychological abuse, um, traumatic brain injuries. 100% um, of people on, de on death row have at least one traumatic brain injury, at least one. Um, and you can get traumatic brain injuries from things as simple as like lead paint exposure and as, as intense as blunt force trauma to the head, right? Like you would think. Um, I'm taking all of these factors into account, um, not to say, let them off scot-free. They didn't actually do this thing, um, but to make sure that they are treated as equitably and as ethically as possible. So what are their needs? What medications do they need to be on? Um, what medications do they not need to be on? Sometimes I'm finding little needles in a haystack. Like um, one time it was uh, metformin. It was, a, it was a diabetes medication that interacted with another medication and he, the client was psychosis for like exactly 72 hours. And that's when it happened after 55 years of a justice event free life. One day this thing happened in 72 hours and then came out of it and had no idea what had happened because he was psychotic. So it's there are so many um, there are so many things that I look for um, and everything matters. Everything matters. Everything a person has been through matters. Um, and, you know, sometimes a win for us is, you know, 40 years instead of life without the possibility of parole. You know, it's not that we're like, oh, just let them do whatever, you know, um, but it's to make sure that their, their story is being told, really. I'm a bit of a storyteller um, and to make sure that they're being treated as ethically as possible. That's my nephew. I don't know if you can hear him. <laughs> uh, JR, I wanted to uh, turn the same question to you. What, what do you think is actually working well about the system? Um, I don't know if my colleague would uh, agree, but... I think the onus on um, prosecutors uh, to turn over uh, Brady, Brady uh, material, Brady materials information that tends to either escapade or mitigate uh, the uh, defendant's uh, involvement in the in the offense. Um, renewed emphasis on something called Giglio material, where you're turning over uh, anything that uh, goes to uh, the credibility of a uh, testifying that couldn't sort of impugn the credibility of a testifying witness. Most of the time uh, we see that in the context of turning over material uh, disciplinary records for uh, police officers um, uh, before they testify, we call that Giglio material. And so um, um, I don't think it's like that in every country in the world. I think prosecutors take their um, um, obligation to turn over Brady and Giglio material to the defense 
regardless of whether or not it hurts um, um, their case in some way. Um, I think we, uh, as prosecutors, as a general term, we take that obligation um, very seriously. And um, I think it's a credit to the legal profession in general. I'm not saying that there are times when there are missteps um, uh, with regards to these obligations, but I think by and large, um, all prosecutors um, um, take that obligation very, very seriously and, and turn over that material uh, when we have to. Thanks. So this, then my next question, in some ways, I'm a little out of order, but but playing on both the strengths and the weaknesses, what's one way in which you would each improve the system? Like what what single thing would you change? Uh, and Shelby, I realize that may be actually cash bell what we talked about before, but uh, Jr. We'll we'll start with you on this one. I don't know if there's one thing <laughs> that I could uh, that I'd want to change, but I will say, um, in order to make a system appear to be fairer and more equitable. I would certainly like to see uh, diversity in all ranks of the criminal justice system. I think we need more folks of color uh, in the judiciary. I think we need more folks of color on, on both sides of the aisle as um, um, attorneys. I think we need uh, more folks of color, uh, not just in the rank and file of the police department, but in the upper brass um, of the uh, police decision. I think we need more folks of color across the country in the district attorney's offices making the big calls, making the big um, uh, decision, uh, because perception is reality. Uh, you know, uh, as a prosecutor, I prosecuted a number of high profile cases. I've tried a number of homicide cases um, in my career. And I'm a person that would oftentimes, you know, look over the other side of the table and talk to talk with the defendant. Sometimes I talk to uh, uh, defendants in a hallway with their with their attorneys. Sometimes I meet with defendants because I wanted to learn um, um, something about them, why they were here. Yeah, I know you're accused of uh, of this, and perhaps we have uh, good evidence. But I still wanted to talk to this person to see if this is a person um, uh, that I should uh, give a, an alternative sentence to what's perhaps is prescribed. And I think a lot of times just being uh, a person of color, uh, speaking to another person of color, uh, even though I was a prosecutor, you know, there was a, 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 a some trust there. Um, and, uh, you know, I tried to build that um, over the years. So I think more, uh, absolutely more diversity within the system um, would create, at least help to create a perception of, of fairness. Uh, Shelby? Yeah, um, I absolutely agree with that, of course. Um, law, criminal law especially, is um, seemingly intentionally confusing to the layperson. <laughs> um, so a big issue I see is people not understanding their rights people not understanding how the legal process works. Um, if you ever sit in a courtroom, um, it is like 50% Latin and 50% acronyms. There's like, a, there's like a language barrier. You don't know what they're saying. Um, so, you know, and people are experts on their own life. It's like if somebody has a rare medical diagnosis, um, it doesn't matter what their education level is. They know a lot <laughs> about these like 12 syllable Latin words that are their diagnosis uh, or their kid's diagnosis. When people have um, have to because of survival, they have to know things. They learn them um, and they learn them quickly. Um, but in terms of the greater function of the system and where they land in it, um, it's extremely confusing. Um, so I, we have some like participatory defense hubs and things like that in Philadelphia, where people can kind of meet with each other and exchange resources and information. Sometimes it's like family members of people who are incarcerated, who they're trying to figure out what they're supposed to do. And it's like a information sharing safe space. Um, and sometimes people practice, um, if they're on bail, sometimes people practice, um, you know, what they're going to say in front of what they're going to say on the stand if they opt to 
um, speak at their own trial. Um, people will practice in front of the rest of them um, and get feedback because they're anxious about the public speaking. Oh, hi, Daddy. Um, we'll so we'll just I think I guess I'm I'm referencing that because I think it's doable. Like I think there's a way for us to do everything in our power to educate people on what this massively serious thing is that they found themselves in. <laughs> um, and, and nobody wakes up one day and decides to commit a crime that will like ruin their and their family's lives. Um, and if they do, you know, there's, there, that, that's where like mental illness comes into play. <laughs> um, people, people live an entire life, um, before the date in question and all of that needs to be explored. Um, not even so much for like a reason, uh, but just to contextualize the person. Um, so once somebody does find themselves in that situation, um, it's really important that they understand what situation they're even in. Um, and going, going farther back in the order of operations, understanding their rights when they get arrested, understanding their rights when they get pulled over um, in a car, people of color, you know, there's an issue there's an issue there. So I want to kind of build on that, uh, heading to the next question and ask you each what you think, especially for those of us that don't have your experience with the system and, and with, I would say, accused uh, uh, criminals in general. How, I mean, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna almost go broader. Where do you think crime and criminal behavior comes from? You know, what, what drives the crime that we see and what do you think is is the best approach to handling that uh and shelby we'll we'll start with you on this one okay wow this is incredibly existential um yeah, and philosoph hard. and philosophical no 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 i'm i'm i hate small talk i don't know how to do it frankly so i'm down um i mean this is incredibly subjective. Your question uh, could only be responded to with a subjective answer. So I'll just tell you what I believe. And I believe that, um, I don't believe that there are evil people who are born evil or something. Um, I just don't believe that. So um, I think people have all sorts of reasons why they do things. Survival is a really major one. Um, and bearing in mind that survival could look like a lot of different ways and mean a lot of different things to different people um, based on their context. Um, and people do things that are really stupid. Uh, people make mistakes. People do things that make no sense. Um, people suffer from mental illness and have uh, experiences with reality that don't mirror the experience of reality that the general public might have. Um, that was a very verbose way to say that, but um, yeah, I think crime exists because humans exist and like human error, human nature, people are gonna do what they're gonna do. There's free will, so people are gonna do what they're gonna do. Um, and you know, working in homicide, I guess something I want to express is that um, serial killers um, are super rare. <laughs> um, you know, when I talk that, when I tell people that I'm in homicide, the idea is that it's like a movie or something, or Law and Order SVU or something like, or yeah, as <laughs> I get it confused because I have SDU at my office, Special Defense Units, so both instead of Special Victims, um, but nine times out of 10, it's like interpersonal violence. Um, obviously we have a major issue um, with mass public murder. Um, that's a big problem. I saw in the, um, in the materials leading up to this that there's question, there, there are questions about guns and gun laws and things like that. And there was much to be said about that. Um, but I guess my answer is, I don't think there are people who are just born evil. I just don't believe that. So um, 
I think that everybody's humanity should be prioritized and preserved through the entire process. If for no, if for no other reason, then it's their constitutional right. <laughs> like, even if you um, need to compartmentalize and like you don't actually, you know what I mean? It's like, that's what has to happen. So they need people, they need people like JR and they need people like me. There have to be both people. Um, and just one real quick thing I'll say, um, I, I, I touched on it earlier, fair and effective, legal counsel, the effective is critical um, because there was a Gideon versus Wainwright's Supreme Court decision that added in the effective um, because people were representing clients who had been charged with crimes and really kind of phoned it in for a while. Um, okay, they have to have an attorney because that's the law, but I'm going to be doing the absolute bare minimum because they should just have whatever happens to them happen to them. Um, and then I believe it was 68, Gideon v. Wainwright. Um, the word effective was added in. Okay, you need to be in good standing with the bar. <laughs> you need to have a law degree. <laughs> you need to have the client's best interest at heart. Um, and in Philadelphia, sorry, this is becoming just an obnoxious love letter to Philadelphia because I love it so much. But um, in Philadelphia, people, grassroots uh, organizing was happening with um, attorneys uh, to provide that type of uh, defense before the federal mandate, like 30 years prior, they were um, trying to prioritize a type of criminal defense that looked like that. So. I got off the rails, but I touched on it earlier and I kind of wanted to circle back and that's where I decided to circle. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, JR? So just as a plug to my old professor, Dr. Gene Ury, we studied uh, Gideon v. Wainwright in constitutional law. Uh, every criminal defendant is entitled to uh, an attorney if they can't afford one. Uh, mm -hmm. case, case was decided in, I believe, 1963. Uh, now, now, I'm going to take your... Uh, your question at a more macro level, uh, micro level, uh, and focus on crime uh, in the inner cities because that's where I work, that's where I'm familiar with, um, and street crime in particular. I think crime, um, as I'm defining it, is driven by poverty, lack of opportunity, and other environmental uh, um, factors, which, which I'll get into. When we talk about poverty, you know, folks don't have money, right? And so they're out there um, in the streets, sometimes stealing because that's uh, what they need to do to, 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 to get by in that particular day. Uh, lack of opportunity. Uh, you can't get a job, right? Because you did not graduate from, from high school, did not go to college, have very little skill. So not too many people will pay you to do much, right? And perhaps with that, you have uh, uh, a criminal record um, uh, that prevents you from, from getting uh, very far in terms of uh, employment. Environmental factors, you grow up around, you grow up in the projects and you grow up around um, um, some kids that are no good that end up being your close friends. And you end up following their lead and you're out there in the streets. Your friend has a gun, actually, you know, he gives you the gun to carry. And it's sort of a, 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 a vicious um, cycle, if you will. And so I think in order to you know, stem the tide in terms of crime, I think as people in the criminal justice system, and, and, and this is perhaps even a political question, we need to invest um, in, in, in our schools, whether they be our public schools, charter schools, whatever, whoever wants to educate our children, we need to invest um, in these schools, okay? We need to invest um, in housing um, um, for folks. We need to invest in some of youth programs for young people uh, that hopefully they won't be out in the street. They'll actually uh, be trying to uh, uh, make some money in the summer. We need to invest in our YMCAs and our parks. You know, as folks in law enforcement, uh, we need to invest in um, credible messengers, folks that they will, um, you know, be able to talk to and listen to that maybe can get them out of the gang. Uh, we're not going to be able to arrest that way out of um, of crime. Um, obviously, enforcement is part of um, um, keeping the public safe. 
and as people in law enforcement, um, um, we're going to enforce uh, uh, when they need. But that can't be a one size fits all. We have to have a, a holistic approach uh, to uh, reducing crime. And some folks will say some of this stuff that I'm talking about is, is, is soft skills or whatever. It's part of the package. It's part of the tools that we need to uh, uh, ultimately keep um, our community safe. Thank you both. Uh, so I have one last question before we move on to some of the questions we received from uh, other alums before this. Uh, we're in the process of launching Criminal Justice Now. Uh, we do have a curriculum in place, but it's one that we uh, intend to revise as we move forward and we learn more about what's best uh, for curriculum like that. The objective of the program is to train people for all sorts of careers in relation to the criminal justice system, including the sorts of jobs you each have, as well as, as really anything that, that might have some sort of relationship with that system. And so I wanted to ask you both each what you think would be an important course or skill or some aspect you think would be really essential to integrating into the curriculum or, or the criminal justice program that we're about to launch. And um, JR, maybe we'll start with you on this one. Um, uh, I believe uh, robust criminal procedure um, course, uh, robust um, trial ad course. I'm a big trial guy. Um, and um, um, you know, I think you guys already do a pretty good mood court competition uh, to get folks arguing. But I think uh, if we're going to have a criminal justice, but you certainly have to have trial ad and, and, and crim pro and um, some sort of, I guess, combination of, uh, uh, I guess you would call that criminology aspect um, um, to the course. Great. Thank you. I'm taking notes right now. So <laughs> shall we? Um as a social worker, you know, what jumps out at me immediately is, you know, public health, sociology, psychology, um, in addition to the things JR already mentioned, um, but more like behavioral, like the behavioral sciences, um, grant writing, um, that is, an extremely valuable and high paying skill that's really specific. You can't just up and write a grant. It's very specific what you need to do. Um, I always speak, I, I've been at Breakthrough the past few years and there was a, a women's symposium and um, an alumni and students of color networking lunch. I've, I've been around SU a bit the past couple of years and something I always say, I mean, my um, undergrad degree is in creative writing. And something I always say is that you'd be surprised how many people are very bad at writing and or editing. Um, and so a skill in writing will always make you a better candidate for a job, <laughs> will also make you better at the job, will always make you better at the job than you have um, because straight up people can't spell, <laughs> you know, people can't, and, and that's just, you know, that's just life, right? It's like, we, we aren't computers, we're people. Um, but if, if you have the ability to communicate effectively, verbally and in, by the written word, that is crucial, especially if you want to become an attorney. Um, being able to communicate efficiently, being able to argue uh, logical and analytical reasoning. So maybe some sort of like LSAT prep, um, you know, there's logical reasoning, analytical reasoning, reading comprehension. Um, I know the joke when I was a creative writing major was that our math credit was logic because it was like word math um, for the writers. And that's that's a really um, integral part of getting into law school is doing those like logic problems. Um, yeah, so, so from my perspective, definitely like the brain, the behavioral, public health, biopsychosocial, um, and then some just very marketable skills like grant writing and writing in general. That's, I would second the legal writing aspect of it because um, that's important, legal writing. Yeah, we're trying to get a course like that off the ground for legal studies also. Yeah. So, Okay, well, I want to move on to some of the questions that we received ahead of time. Um, and Shelby referenced one that we received, which was about guns. And that question 
sort of reference gun violence that we're seeing in society. And the question is, you know, how do you think we can tackle that problem while preserving uh, the rights that are afforded under the Second Amendment? Um, and so I think Shelby, we'll, we'll start with you on this one. Yeah, um, so there's something called the violation of the Uniform Firearms Act. Um, and it's a charge that people can receive um, for using a firearm that isn't registered, using a firearm with the serial number obliterated. Um, and then if you have a, if you, if you use or even have a firearm on your person or are in a place where there is a firearm, <laughs> so it's somebody else's house and they have a piece locked up somewhere in their house, you're in someone's car, it's in the glove box. Um, you can receive a VUFA charge, um, and which is violation of Uniform Firearms Act. And there are different um, types of VUFAs based on, you know, open carrying, carrying without a license, carrying on the street, carrying without a permit. Um, so I bring that up because guns are massive responsibilities. <laughs> um, owning them, carrying them, discharging them. Um, they are obviously incredibly lethal um, and bear a lot of responsibility. So um, while the Second Amendment is the Second Amendment, um, I certainly think that a very thorough um, understanding of what guns are and are not and what guns should and should not do uh, should be un should be established um, before people have them <laughs> they're incredibly dangerous um uh yeah it's this is such a political subject that's like spans so much more than just what I do for a living and what JR does for a living. It's like the fastest way to like get into an argument with somebody um, or something. But um, yeah, I mean, there's obviously an issue. There certainly don't need to be more of them. <laughs> um, I don't believe that um, like fighting fire with fire or whatever, where it's like, oh, if people have guns and like you just need to be armed. Uh, the schools just need to be armed. That's the problem. I don't believe in that. Um, so I guess my answer is the Second Amendment exists. And I think that the route to gun ownership should be comprehensive. <laughs> um, and involve a lot of metrics, <laughs> should I say. Um, a lot of data points that need to be met or not met or something. This is also off the dome. So if I sound something, I, I don't know. These are just my thoughts though, off the top. Well, I, was, I was at lunch today and um, they were serving cake in the cafeteria that had a lot of frosting and I used a knife to cut into it. And then I somehow managed to get the knife all over my pants, which is my way of saying nobody should ever want me to have a gun ever. Uh, it's not gonna turn out well, but uh, uh, JR, what, what are your thoughts uh, on this? Well, I took some, I took some notes because it's an important question. Um, I think this is more of a political question than a legal one. Um, I think we can agree that uh, far too many children are dying at the hand of gun violence in this country. Um, and this isn't just attributable to mass shootings that that get a lot of the press coverage. But there are, as I mentioned, there are a lot of uh, a lot of kids disproportionately black and brown who are getting gunned down in their very neighborhoods or on the very street that they live. Um, so how do we address this going forward? Um, I think politicians have to come together to work towards common sense solutions. Uh, no person nor political party um, has a monopoly on good ideas. As part of uh, what I would call a holistic approach, politicians have to look at legislating in the area of mental health when it comes to who's allowed to purchase slash own a firearm. We have to look at whether it makes sense 
to set a federal standard for red flag laws. We have to, instead, right now it's state to state. Uh, we have to look at um, what's reasonable um, in terms of background checks and waiting periods. Some folks may argue that we need to ban certain types of assault weapons or high capacity type weapons like AR-15s. Um, whereas some may argue that the Second Amendment protects the right to have these types of weapons, right? There's two sides to every coin. Can politicians work towards a compromise in this area? I believe they can. Perhaps if one is going to purchase one of these uh, high capacity or uh, assault type uh, uh, weapons, then they, they should be subject to enhanced screening in order to uh, purchase and own these types of weapons. And so I think compromise can be had across the board. It's not take all your guns away or no, I want to keep all my guns. I think grownups have to get in a room and hash this out. Um, 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 the Second Amendment, um, some folks will argue that it gives an unfettered right to um, um, folks to bear arms. Other folks may uh, read the actual text of the Second Amendment, which um, speaks to a well-regulated militia. Um, and so, again, there are arguments on both sides. Can I can I say some more on that, if that's okay? Well, I'm a, I'm, I'm a little worried because we're running out of time, and I want to get okay. at least one more question in there. I'm sorry. I know okay. all of these are topics we could talk a full hour about. Um, but I did I did want to get to at least one more question, and, and this does speak to something that we've been talking about the last hour. So one of the other questions submitted said that there's a perception that there are two standards of criminal justice, one for whites and the well-to-do and another for minorities. Have you seen this? And if so, is this a serious problem that is having an adverse effect on the criminal justice system? So obviously I think you each have spoken to that in some ways already, but um, this is putting it a lot more directly. Uh, and I can't, Shelby, we'll start with you on this one. Yeah, I mean, um... Racism is as American as America is. Um, the two are intrinsically linked and <laughs> um, it permeates everything. Healthcare um, is different for white people and well-to-do people or whatever the wording was and people of color. Um, black women die in childbirth at an alarming rate because when they have a pain scale of one to 10 and they tell what their pain scale is, they aren't believed. Um, that it's, there's just a, a major discrepancy that exists and always has. Um, speaking of guns real quick to this point, um, everybody's worried about their guns being taken away and about having unfettered access say to firearms. Um, but that seems to be really one-sided because if a black person is pulled over and they are asked to show their ID and they reach into their pocket to get their wallet, they are shot because you know a white person's AR-15 is less intimidating than a black person's pretend, maybe make-believe hypothetical gun that is actually a wallet. Because the argument is always, well, they might've been armed. I feared for my life. I was acting um, the way I'm supposed to, the way I was trained because I thought that they were pulling a weapon. Um, black people get all sorts of um, charges for like public nuisance, public drunkenness. Um, and, and, and I mean, that goes back to like vagrancy laws in Jim Crow um, or not even Jim Crow, like right after 1865, right after the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, there were these vagrancy laws where it was illegal for Black people to be unemployed. So they would have to take work. And because they had to take work or be in jail, they would take work no matter what the um, circumstances were surrounding that employment. And people knew that, so they would pay them like two cents or one cent or something. Um, which is slavery. <laughs> um, and if you did go to jail because you didn't have a job, it would be like a labor camp. So slavery. Um, uh, I, I guess I say this because there are laws 
that are straight up to catch black people like just being around <laughs> um terroristic threats is just like cursing loudly in public um there are all sorts of charges like that and don't get me started on the criminalization of drugs and the war on drugs and <laughs> crack cocaine versus powder cocaine like don't even get me started um but yeah basically everything about the system is it's two Americas. <laughs> I recommend anybody familiarizing themselves with James Baldwin, and I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Jr. I took some notes in this regard too, because it's an important question. Um, where you are on the socioeconomic spectrum has a direct correlation uh, to outcomes in America. It's not always dispositive, but uh, where you are on the socioeconomic you know, sort of ladder plays a big factor. And so how does this permeate the criminal justice system? If you're higher up uh, on the socioeconomic uh, ladder, you're gonna be able to afford to hire a private attorney to represent you if you happen to come in contact uh, with the criminal justice system. For those of lower status, as my colleague here uh, mentioned, uh, they will perhaps have to rely on the services of a public defender, not that, there aren't plenty of great public defenders and defender organizations out there, but they oftentimes have higher caseloads than the private attorney um, and are getting pulled in many different directions um, every single day. Um, and so they have less time to focus on your particular defense. Uh, socioeconomic status may also grant you access that others may not have. You know, perhaps because of who you are, you can you can get a meeting with the DA or an executive in the DA's office who's handling the case, and you can advocate for yourself at that meeting with the actual uh, decision makers. Right? Most people don't get an opportunity um, to do that because of where they are um, on the sort of socioeconomic ladder. Um, I fully appreciate a view shared by many that there are two standards uh, of criminal justice, but to the extent that that view is shared. I believe that the issue is one uh, primarily attributable to economic status, right? It's not lost on me that in America, race and economic status are often one and the same, often intertwined. However, I'm not of the belief that the vast majority of folks who work in the criminal justice system are making decisions primarily based on race. This is not to say that the criminal justice system is in any way immune from the notion of unconscious bias. Unconscious bias permeates all aspects of American life. And it, you know, that can certainly play a role in the decisions made by police officers out in the field, as well as decisions made by prosecutors in the courtroom. Uh, the job of all of us involved in the criminal justice system, I believe, is to work intentionally to root out unconscious bias. We have to conduct routine trainings with staff, have regularly uh, review data regular, regularly. Uh, we should be looking at who's getting arrested, what the dispositional outcomes are, who's getting sent to state prison versus who's getting probation. Are there discrepancies or trends that can singularly be attributable to race? A comprehensive review of this kind of data should inform our decisions and policy making uh, going forward. Okay. Thank you both. We're, we're right at eight o'clock now, and I'm sorry to everybody that's uh, tuned in. I wasn't able to get to any more of the audience questions, but I think we had a great discussion. I really appreciate everything you both brought and your expertise and experiences. Um, so uh, nobody can join me in a round of applause, but but thank you both for, for everything uh, uh, that came across. And I'm more convinced of, than ever of the importance of this program we're about to launch. Uh, and what we might be able to achieve with it. So um, with that, I have a script here that I'm gonna turn back to. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. This concludes the alumni webinar series for this semester. Upcoming alumni events uh, include a service event at Cradles to Crowns in Philadelphia on April 25th. 
uh, the Sigmund Weiss School of Business golf outing on April 28th, and the homecoming reunion weekend that'll take place next fall, October 20th and 21st. Uh, for more information about these and other events, please go to www.sualum.com. And again, thank you to JR and Shelby both uh, for joining us uh, this evening and for all of our alumni attendees and everyone have a good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Night, Shelby. Good night. Nice to meet you virtually. <laughs> you too.